and good evening folks. Welcome to the live stream. I'm really quite excited about tonight. So um, I, I wasn't on the, uh, the last minute getting ready for it and I can see already we've got 20 people uh, watching. So welcome. I know there are some new faces uh, here. It's first time watching the live stream. Um, it's really great to have you aboard and have you um, uh, joining, uh, joining me on this. Uh, just uh, my usual welcomes to everyone. Um, if you're watching this for the first time, please put your name in the, uh, the live chat so I know who you are. I can give you a proper welcome. Particular welcomes uh, to, uh, to Patricia, who's the first time, uh, time viewer on here. And uh, I can see some of the regulars on here already. Uh, Kev, Michael, uh, Peter, uh, Terry is there. Thank you, Terry, for sending out the details of the live stream to people. It um, is probably responsible for the, uh, the uptake in subscriptions I've had to my YouTube channels today. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. So let's, uh, let's make a start as uh, a few other people are joining us. Um, I just want to explain a little bit about how the live stream um, works. They are weekly shows uh, every Sunday night at 7.30. This is the 14th one. Uh, oh, I see uh, some other new names in here as well. John Stubbs. Thank, uh, welcome, John. Great to see you. Tony uh, as well. Uh, and Lars joining us uh, this week as well. Great to have you all aboard. Um, yeah, as I was saying, they are weekly shows and at 7.30, they live on my YouTube stream for a while in full, but the aim is that I will be taking them down to a cut-down version for YouTube and the full version will appear in my online academy. Um, I'm a little bit behind on sorting that out. I say that every week, but I have been working on it during the week. So uh, it won't be long before some of the older ones start disappearing. So if you do enjoy this and want to see some of the old ones, um, then catch them uh, quickly before they go down. Uh, right, um, yeah, I am po posting extracts on YouTube from them. So things like the three minute challenges will be, uh, are going up there in, the, in their entirety without the, uh, the little bits in between. So they're, they're fo more focused videos and some of the, the nuggets of it. Some of the techniques that I talk about are going up there as their own live stream, uh, their, not live streams, their own videos in their own right as well. Uh, so uh, uh, keep an eye on the, the YouTube channel for that. Do ask any questions. I do try to deal with, uh, with questions uh, during the live stream. And uh, wow, I can see, uh, uh, see the numbers are going up on here. Uh, we've got a few other names that uh, uh, new to me, AJ Green. Good evening, uh, Roy. Uh, uh, first time for you. Nice to nice to have you aboard. Hope you enjoy the show. A um, couple of other names I recognise, but I don't know whether it's first time watching or not. Uh, if it is your first time, you're really welcome here. Yeah, ask the questions in chat. I, uh, I've got some which have been sent to me in advance. I'm going to deal with those. Those which come in live, I have a section towards the end of the live stream where I, where I deal with them on there. Just be aware, there is a time lag between me speaking and you hearing me. It's typically about 30 seconds, but it can be as long as, um, as two minutes, which means if you wait till the point when I say, right, now let's go for, over for any questions, what happened on one occasion was uh, I said that, everyone started typing in the questions, but they hadn't hear, uh, because of the time lag, uh, they didn't hear me ask for the questions until two minutes after I'd asked it, by which stage I hadn't seen any questions, so I closed the live stream down. So get your questions in early. I will go through them and check, um, check up on them as the stream goes on. And again, seeing more on here. Harry, hi, nice to see you. New, another new face on the, on the live stream on there. Uh, if you're watching this on a replay, I know there's a few folks who do watch on replay rather than live then put your questions in the comments on there, or you can email them to me, or you can ask questions in my Facebook group. And I'll talk a little bit about the Facebook group a little bit later uh, for those who aren't aware of that. 
So I always say helping with the live stream, there are a number of little things you can do. First of all, if you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channels, please do so. It really does help me. I need to get the uh, subscriber numbers up. I need to get the watch time up so that I can monetize the channel because I need to actually earn some money from doing this and prevent uh, presenting uh, uh, this photography information to people. Uh, comment on the videos. If you watch a video and it's helpful, just say it's helpful. That really helps me because one of the metrics that YouTube uses is the amount of uh, uh, comments that I get and my response to them, the fact that I respond to them. If you don't post any comments, I can't respond to them. So please add comments on there. And if you've got questions from a video, I do try to answer them as well uh, on that. Um, and uh, go and like the videos as well, like this one. Come on, you know you want to do it. Go and hit like bu the like button uh, as, you, as you're doing this. And, uh, and be like Terry and share links to the show. He's let a whole load of people know about the show this, uh, this weekend. And I know that that's where a number of the newbies are, uh, are coming from. So my, my real thanks to, to Terry for, for doing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, the other things uh, with the live stream, uh, I have a section, the three minute uh, Lightroom challenge, uh, which is myself and Rick Bradbury. We have three minutes to edit an image. I am always looking for new people to take part in that for supplying images. Once you've seen it in the show tonight, if you want one of your images doing, then get in touch and I'll send you the details on how to do that. I'm also looking for volunteers to interview about their photography work. I've got um, Kev Pack uh, lined up. He should have been on tonight, but there was a little bit of i um, I'll explain later when we get to the three minute edit as to what happened. Um, so I've postponed Kev till, uh, till next week and it will be on next week's Kev. I promise, I promise it will be on there. So I'll be looking for volunteers for that as well. I've also got, I mean, Terry's going to be doing that as well, but anybody else later on wants to take part. Once you've seen one, you know what's involved. Um, send, uh, get in contact and I'll send you some information so that you know what, uh, what you need to do uh, on there. Uh, so what's on the show tonight? Well, we've got the usual news roundup. Uh, our theme is night photography. I haven't quite got as much on night photography as I'd planned. Again, I'll explain when we get to the three minute edit as to what happened there. We've got the three minute edit challenge. Uh, we've got the live Q&A and I've already got two questions in on that. Uh, and so let's get started with the news. And let's start off with my own news um, as people are starting to join. Uh, a couple of videos went up on my main channel this week. Uh, one regular two minute tip, Lightroom hints and tips. This one, it's the first part of a two parter. Uh, the, fir the first part is how to create a smart collection in Lightroom to locate any files that haven't yet been converted to DNG. And I'm a big advocate of converting your raw files to DNG. Uh, so uh, uh, please uh, have, have a look at that. Part two will be coming out this week, which is how you then do the conversion. And uh, uh, then perhaps I'll do one about more on the importance of it. I have mentioned it a few times in the past at events I've been running on other videos and in the live stream. I've also put up there the, um, the first of these photographer showcases. It's one from David Jones. Uh, it was a little bit of a, a week late getting it up there. Uh, I had no end of trouble editing that video. Uh, nothing to do with anything to do with David when you're watching this. Uh, it's just DaVinci Resolve decided to play all sorts of games with me and the rendering failed now many times on it. It is a not safe for work video because a couple of the images that David shows and shares with us uh, include artistic nudity. So if that's not your thing, then please don't watch it. If you do want to watch it, um, then you will need to have restrictive mode taken off within YouTube so you can see it. Otherwise it will be hidden from you on there. And uh, oh, before I move on to the next one, I can see a few a few other um, uh, names in there. Walter Reynolds, long time no see, yes. How are you doing, Ro uh, Walter? Good to have you on board um, on here. Right, okay, back to the news. 
Yeah, two videos up on the channel, the travel photography channel. So if you're into travel photography, do subscribe to that one. I'm separating out all my general photography and studio photography from the travel one. The travel um, photography has got its own channel now. So this week I did a time lapse uh, of uh, one of the cruise maritime ships, the Ocean Countess, leaving Stockholm. That went up there and a tutorial that's never been posted anywhere before all about photographing details when you're doing travel photography and I've filmed it on location in Cherbourg uh, and it was a particular square Place de General de Gaulle and it's a fantastic place for shooting details so go and have a look at that if travel photography is your thing and uh, you can see some hints and tips on how to improve your travel photography on there and the live streams I've scheduled the next six after tonight uh, I'm not planning on changing that schedule but you never know um, I do want to keep the schedule um, flexible uh, to account for things which may happen questions that may come in that may warrant a, a longer period of time I may have to juggle things around a little bit but I think those themes are, for the next six weeks are pretty much set uh, some of you may have seen the longer list. I know Terry sent it out to a few people and that um, those later ones are purely provisional. I know they will change because things will come up and I think, right, I need to get that in there earlier rather than later. But that's just to give you an idea of the sort of things which are coming up on the live stream. Um, my blog yeah, um, on my website and the link to that is down below. Uh, I, um, I posted a new blog today. It was supposed to be the start of a series of an A to Z of, of photography. And I did some brainstorming for it and I, um, I got too many ideas. So I've got all the ideas gathered together in a, in a document. I ended up with 200 different titles for blog posts, just brainstorming and asking people for, uh, for ideas. And um, so the blog this week is about what I'm going to do with all those ideas. And I do need input from you guys to know which ones of those you particularly want me to do blog posts on. And I'm kind of thinking I'm going to try and do them both as written blogs and as videos as well. Uh, that's a little bit uncertain at the moment. That's what I'm thinking of. So if you want to see the full list, you need to join my uh, Facebook group. If you just search for Ian's Studio uh, on Facebook, you'll find the group. I've got the link down below, below the video on there, and um, I'll admit you into the group. And you can have a look at the document and the list on there. Uh, so it's that. So taking me on to Facebook groups, then, yep, that's that's the link to it. Uh, so that's where you can find me. And one special thing: if you are a member of that group. We're talking about night photography to, uh, tonight. So if you've got any night images to hand, share them on the group there. And I'll go and have a look at the end and see if there are any that I can just talk about right at the end of the live stream um, to, to show those uh, on, on there. Let's see your night images, not just mine. Uh, that's where the blog topic list is. I talk, uh, it's also where I share a lot of information. It's the first place I post things. So if I put a new video up on YouTube, I'll put a post on there. If I've got questions or I need input for a, a live stream or a video, I'll ask it on there. So it's a great place to hang out. It's also a place where you can ask questions, either ones for the live stream or ones that uh, you can get people to, uh, uh, to answer or put images up for critiquing and things like that. Great place to hang out. So please, uh, please check that out. And also Rick, who does the three minute challenge with me and is nominally my co-host uh, when we're not in lockdown and having to social distance. Um, he has uh, his own Facebook group. His is more focused on studio photography. Again, link down below. So if that's your thing, go and join his group as well. Right, let's look at the industry news. Big news this week, I'm sure most of you have already heard. The photography show, which should have taken place in March, but got cancelled due to the, or postponed, you know, due to the COVID-19, and got postponed through to September, has now been, well, sort of postponed, cancelled, changed again. 
It is happening in September, but not face to face. It's happening online in September. Uh, so the 20th and the 21st of September, there's going to be this big thing online. Hey, wait a minute. I think that clashes with one of my live streams. I'll have to have a word with them about that. No, only joking. Um, no, uh, there'll be some things happening online. Uh, the actual show at the NEC now isn't happening until September 2021. That's uh, well over a year away. And here was me hoping for some bargains um, from the show. So what do people think about that, the delay in the photographer show? I think it's, um, it's sad, but inevitable, I think. I think it's better to be safe than sorry with it. So I think we just have to live with that one. The other news for the Canon shooters. Do we have many Canon shooters out there? Um, a lot of people are moving away from them these days, but uh, I'm still uh, a Canon shooter and proud of it. Uh, the rumor is that the beginning of next month will finally see the announcement for the long-awaited EOS R5 and R6. And that's um, the screen you can see there. That's from Canon Rumors uh, website. And they're reckoning beginning of the ne uh, next month, 2nd of July. They also think that the price is going to be below $4,000. I sincerely hope it is. Um, because if it's anything above that, I can't be buying it. Um, when Rick and I did a, a, a chat about our thoughts on these, uh, these cameras, and you'll find that in, the, uh, in my YouTube channel, we were reckoning about three and a half thousand pounds, which kind of ties up with that. And I still hold to, to that. I think about three and a half thousand pounds when it's released. So I don't know what uh, everyone else thinks on that, but Watch out for that in uh, a month's time. Here's another interesting bit of news that happened, and that's to do with copyright and Instagram. And uh, I don't know whether this one's passed you by, but uh, there's a court case. And a photographer successfully um, uh, sued uh, someone for embedding, for embedding one of his photos from Instagram onto the website. And Instagram have come out and said, or Facebook, who own Instagram, that although they have a, a, the, the license permits certain things, they do not permit embedding on third-party websites of posts. And so if you're embedding somebody's Instagram image directly from Instagram, you could be in violation of copyright. You need to have the permission of the photographer to be able to do that. Now, I think that's a good thing. It's a big company finally coming out and recognizing that uh, the internet isn't the big wild west where anything goes in terms of copyright. And those of us who are photographers, we've been saying this for years and years, you can't just use my images on there. Just because it's posted in a, on a public website does not mean it's a free for all. So I think it's a good thing. Um, what I think might be a bit of a downside to it is a lack of clarity um, with some people and a lack of understanding. People will not know this. It's not been well publicized. Um, if we as photographers are only just finding out about it, then the general public aren't going to, to know anyway. So things aren't going to change until Instagram make it very, very clear to the general public that that sort of thing is not permitted. And if you want to see the article, go over to Petapixel because they've got it on their website, a lot of information about it. It's quite an interesting little read, actually. So uh, ha have, a, have a look at that. Uh, right. Uh, another news story, final news story. I don't know what people think about this one. Again, this is off Petapixel. Um, it's weird. It's somebody calling for the end of the use of the terms slave and master for um, control for flash units. 
Can you believe it? You have a, we all use the term, the master unit and the slave unit. In other words, the one that's being driven by the other. And if you read the article upon uh, Petapixel, they're saying things like, well, just imagine if, if you got a, a black assistant, would you be comfortable say, saying, could you put that into slave mode, please? And I'm thinking, is this really taking political correctness too far? I'm, I'm not sure. What do you think, folks, on this one? This is, I think this one's really weird. I think it's a step too far. Because, maybe it's because of my background. When I started in photography, I specialised in the Middle East. And I have a real interest in, uh, in Egypt and the Middle East. And to me, when somebody says slave, I don't necessarily think black. I think um, of Egypt. I think of, um, of ancient history uh, in, in that period of time. So I'm not thinking uh, black. Next thing I'm thinking with slave is the thing about modern slavery, and that's irrespective of colour. So do we really need to change that term? I don't know um, on there. To me, it just seems a little bit crazy. So anyway, that's uh, the end of the news. So let's just move on to, to Q&A. Before I do that, let me have a quick look at what's uh, been going on in, in chat uh, whilst, uh, whilst I've been talking. Uh, Gary Platt, what would you push? What would push you to purchase a higher cost f2.8 versus f4 lens? What are the factors that influence that decision? Oh, nice question. I'll deal with that one at the end um, on there. Um, a few interesting things. Depends how people responding to that. Um, oh, uh, Patricia spotting my Gdansk uh, images. Yeah, lovely place, Gdansk. I, I, a fantastic place to go and photograph if you're over there. Uh, Michael reckoning political correctness gone crazy with uh, uh, Master Slave. Uh, master and Commander would be a fun alternative. Isn't Master and Commander both uh, synonyms for the same thing? So what do you call the, um, uh, the one that's being controlled? So how about um, Dom and Sub? <laughs> Put that one out there. Uh, right, okay, question and answer. I had two um, questions come in during the week, but if you've got any more, for later in the show, stick them into the chat. I'll come back to them later in the show. Oh, that was a leftover from last week. Uh, do remember the delay um, on there. So the first question I want to deal with comes from Terry. And Terry asked me a question during the week, and he asked me to deal with it on the live show. And this is what he said. He said, I made a load of edits to my image in Lightroom. How do I export the before image without losing the edits? Is there anything I can do before I start editing the photo that makes extracting the before and after easier? Right, okay. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to flip over to Lightroom and I'll talk you through the process on there. And this is ridiculously easy. You'll be kicking yourself, Terry. So, right. So here we are in Lightroom. Now, Terry, you'll recognize the photo. This was your image from the uh, three minute edit challenge that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with your image. So that, what we have on the screen now, or on the screen as you're looking at it, is the after image. Uh, that was after I'd done all the edits. So, what we need to do is to find the before image. But before I start playing around with anything like that, the first thing I want to do is to go over and create a snapshot. Now, I'm gonna go full screen on this uh, so that it's easier for you to see. And also because I'm gonna be looking at the screen here and all you're gonna see is the side of my face anyway. So let's go full screen. Here we go. Head over to snapshots. And you can see I've not got any on here. So this is my final version. So at this point, what I'm going to do is create a snapshot. And it's got a little dialog box, which appeared on the wrong screen. So I'll just pull it down and asks me for a name. So I'm going to call this IMB edit on there. Create. Now, 
that means I've saved the, the state of this, uh, this edit um, as a snapshot. I can always come back to it. Now, the aim is, the aim is that I'm not going to use that snapshot, but I always create it to protect myself in case something goes wrong with what I'm about to show you. So moving over to the next one down, we've got the history. And you can see here all the steps that I did in processing this image, uh, right back to the import. So I select that, that's the image as it came in. So that might be the before stage, but actually that may not be the before that you're after. We could actually have something else as our before. Here we could have, uh, we could say that um, after I've sorted the angle out on it, we might want that as the before. So now I can select any of these history states to be uh, the, the one that I want uh, to work with and I want to export. So I'm going to say this one. Now, uh, just as an aside on this, an extra bonus tip for you. If you want to show before and after in Lightroom, it's the slash key, um, which is top left to bottom right slash. And if I press that now, it toggles between, well, actually it's not toggling between anything, which is quite interesting. Because what it does, it toggles between what you set as the before and what you're currently on. So if I go up to the front, the, the, the final edit, now I do the before and after, you might be wondering, why is it not the last image on the list? Why is it not that? It's because you can choose what the before is. And I could choose this last one, and I right click on it, and uh, where it says copy history step settings to before. So I do that, now the before and after. Huh. Oh, I know why. Before and after option in Lightroom doesn't respect the crop. It's only the processing settings, so it's picking the crop up on there. So that would be the reason why it really was going to that last one. Let me pick a later one to just try and show you um, with it. Sorry about that. Right. Just before I convert to black and white, so let's go with that one. And right click on that and set that as my before. So I'll go up to the latest one. And now my before and after, please work. Yes, it's worked this time. Toggles between the final edit and the one I set as the before. Anyway, that was an aside. Uh, in answer to your question, Terry, I can go down to the history. That was my, the one I decided I want as my before was that one. So I can now go and say export and I'm going to do a very quick export on it. Um, use there, export, and I'm going to say a low res image. I'm just going to put it in a temp folder on there, and out it goes. So, done the export. Now, we look at the history, it's created an extra history step uh, up here. Uh, my final, my where my snapshot was, was here on the update there. So I've still got that. So now I've come back to that one and I can say uh, on there, I can export that. So right click, export. And if I say export with previous, it will say it already exists, use unique names and it will put it in the same folder alongside it with a different name. So I've got the, uh, the before and after, uh, I've got the before and after images together uh, all in the folder. So I just double check, I'm just gonna double check what's in that folder. Yep, there we go, the two different versions in the folder um, on there, before and after. Uh, so, I didn't need the preset, but if you want, when you bring an image in, when you've decided what your before one is, you could also create another preset. And I could say, right, create preset, 
and so not presets, what am I talking about? I meant snapshot, create snapshot. And I could call this one before. So I've got, I've got two snapshots there and I can just toggle between them that way as well. So lots of different possibilities for you there, uh, Terry. So uh, let's come back over here. Yeah. Right. I'm just getting an error message on the screen here. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will experience buffering. So my apologies for the buffering, folks. I don't know how far behind you are. Um, right. Uh, so I'm just going to have a quick look at the comments before I move on. Uh, a couple of new faces appearing on there. Uh, Kevin, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. Uh, Raymond, hello. Um, right. And uh, a question. Uh, Patricia, you do a lot of architectural photography, always use Photoshop. Could I convince you to use Lightroom? Quick answer, yes I can. I'll, have, I'll talk to that a little bit later. Uh, right, okay, so uh, let's move on to the next question. And this one comes from David, David Jones, who did the uh, Photographer's Showcase. Now, David tends to watch uh, on the replay rather than live. So I'm not expecting to get any um, uh, feedback on this from David immediately. Uh, but if you are watching, do let me know in the, uh, 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 in the comments or in the, in the chat. And what David asks is, he's contemplating acquiring a long zoom uh, for doing fitness uh, shows that would um, and that'd be his main reason for it. He uses the Panasonic. Um, he was thinking about the 100 to 30 uh, F4 to F5.6, but he's also found the 100 to 400, but it's uh, uh, an F4 to 6.3. And uh, it's an extra 200 quid as well. Would it be worth getting the extra reach, uh, but the slower speed? Bearing in mind that the 100 to 400 is about double the price. Ouch. Uh, any thoughts uh, on there? Right. Okay. Yeah. Some thoughts on, uh, on this, David. Uh, not necessarily the ones you're thinking of. Now, uh, when it comes to this, I asked David a few extra questions, what he meant by a fitness show. And it's basically fitness on stage, uh, performance, presumably bodybuilding, that type of thing. And um, he, he put it in terms that I could understand by saying it's like a theatre production. <laughs> That's talking my language. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I do a lot of theatre photography. So he's now talking my language. And so uh, what, we, uh, what we're doing uh, on this, I want to look at it from a theatre point of view. Now, there are some unknowns with this. What I don't know, David, is how far away from the stage area you're going to be. Do you really need that extra reach? When I'm doing theatre photography, I'm right up against the stage. I'll, go, I'll come in close um, to, to create the images. So I don't necessarily need a long lens on there. But if I was at the back of the auditorium, then yeah, something like 300 millimetre I would need. Now, Here's where the problem starts with it. It's all to do with the amount of light you've got on your subject. Now, um, David did say it's like theatre, only the lighting is brighter. And to be honest, I don't believe you on that one. Um, I don't think the lighting will necessarily be that much brighter. When I'm doing theatre photography, yes, it can be low, but stage lights are typically quite bright or relatively bright anyway. And I'm going to show you an image, a theatre image, where a lot of light was on because I was doing a cast photo. And here it is. It's um, a cast photo um, shot uh, from a play called Rumours. And the... 
uh, the thing here was because I was doing the cast photo, the lighting guys put all the lights on for me. And the settings I got on this were 160th of a second at f4, and I was still shooting at ISO 1250. So here is where we need to do some maths. I'm going to assume, David, that the lighting that you are working with for your fitness shows is going to be a similar sort of brightness to when I was doing this cast photo. If that's the case, let's look at these two lenses. Now, the 400 millimeter option, there is no point in buying the 400 millimeter one unless you are going to use it at 400 millimeter. You might as well save the money if you're not gonna use it at that for your chosen subject. So what do you need to be able to run at 400 millimeters with it? Well, I don't know whether you have access to use a tripod when you're doing those shows. I'm going to assume that you don't, because if it's a live show with an audience in, the chances are they're not necessarily gonna let you have a tripod there. So if you're hand holding a lens at 400 millimeter, on a camera with a crop sensor, at, with a crop factor of two, that's the equivalent of holding an 800 millimeter lens. You need to have a shutter speed of at least one eight hundredth of a second to be able to hand hold it. So let's look at the maths, what you need to do to achieve that. I'm going to have to refer to my notes on this because this is a little bit mathematical uh, if I'm going to ex uh, explain it. So my shot that you can see there was at 160th of a second. To get that to uh, one, eight, one eight hundredth of a second, I would lose two and a third stops of light. So that's 320, 640, and uh, a third stop on top of that to 800 is uh, two and a third stops of light lost to shoot at that, at, at that speed under that lighting. You would be shooting at f6.3. That's another loss of one and a third stops of light. That's a total of three and two thirds stops of light uh, difference compared to the shot I'm showing you. So to do that, you are going to have to increase your ISO by three and two thirds stops, assuming the lighting was the same as the conditions I was shooting under. My ISO was at 1,250. Uh, three and one third stops above that is 12,500. Now that's typically the maximum on most cameras and you would therefore still be one third underexposed at 400 millimeter because you push your ISO to the highest point. So you either are a third underexposed or you have to reduce your shutter speed to something which is marginal on being able to handhold it. So think about that. Even if you do go at that ISO, are you happy with the noise that you get at that, uh, at that ISO. So those are your main factors on there. Let's look at the other option you talked about, which was the, um, uh, the 100 to 300. Now with that, uh, going through all the maths on it, basically uh, it's um, th three and a third stops you'd need on that. And basically you'd be shooting at ISO 10,000 with it which is marginally better uh, on there. So that's your biggest issue, is the ISO you'd have to go up to to be able to handhold at those sort of shutter speeds. Now, let me just show you one other thing. One of the, one of the things that, um, uh, that David mentioned is he, no, he hasn't used anything at 300 millimeter or effectively 600 millimeter on his camera. Uh, so he doesn't know whether he really needs that. I'm suspecting that you probably don't. 
And let me show you some images to try and uh, try and prove that. All right, I'm going to have to take myself off this. Right, um, this is a scene uh, taken with a 300 millimeter lens. What I want you to do, David, is look at the size of that boat in the in the frame, and. Imagine with a, a, a two time with a crop factor of two at six, effectively at 600 millimeter on your camera, that boat would fill the frame. That's a 300 millimeter, so effectively 600 millimeter to be twice the size. So it would literally be from um, uh, from pointy end to blunt end would fill the frame uh, on that. So as I effectively zoom out on this image, I want you to try and think about what that actually means on there. So that is 105 millimeter, which is probably what you're normally used to uh, on your, your camera. That's probably your, your full zoom at the moment. Uh, for most people it is if they haven't got a telephoto lens. So round about there, move out again, 70. 50 millimeter, right, this is the one I want to pause on because 50 millimeter is the equivalent to what the human eye actually sees. So that's how far away you appear to be from your subject, from the boat. So that's what a 300 millimeter lens would give you. Or in your case, that's the, on the, the two times um, crop factor, that entire boat is what you would get in the scene. You'd see a scene like that, your lens will bring you right into the full thing. Are you really going to be that far away when you do the fitness shows? I don't know. But think about that. Do you really need that length of zoom? I don't know, because I don't know what these shows are like. I wouldn't need, on any theatre production that I do, anything as long as 600 millimetres or 800 millimetres. I'd have to be shooting from the back of a really big theatre to want to use that. So I'm not sure you're going to need the, the more expensive lens on there. And just for completeness, if I come out to my wide angle here of 19 millimetre, that boat, you can barely see it on there. So that's the effect of, the, of how good um, those lenses would be. Do you really need that much zoom? Only you can answer that one, David. So, right, let's move on. Our three minute Lightroom challenge. I'm just gonna to explain to those who are new to the stream how, they, how this works. I'm provided with an image from, um, from a photographer, a raw file, no edit supplied to it. I don't get to see the image beforehand other than a, a little quick sneak peek as I load it into Lightroom. I also send it off to fellow photographer, Rick Bradbury, and we have three minutes to do an edit on it. And then later on in the stream, we will um, we'll give you some feedback on, on the image. I am looking for more people to take part in it. If you've not had an image done before, you will take pre precedence over those which have already been done. Now, this should have been a night image. I had a night image lined up. I'd given it to Rick to do. The problem was, and it's not Rick's fault, I got the numbering wrong, which meant the a few minutes before this stream was about to start, I loaded all the videos in to, to stream them to discover that the, the image that I had and the image that, um, uh, Stuart, uh, that um, Rick had from Stuart Reese were two different images. So... Unfortunately, Rick hadn't done the night one, so we've, have to, we've had to go to a landscape image instead, which is really unfortunate because the reason I'm not doing Kev's um, showcase tonight was because I wanted to put a lot a photography, uh, a, sorry, a night photography image on the three minute challenge. So my apologies to, to Kev, my apologies to Stuart, this is not the image it should be, but please enjoy it anyway. And I'm going to start with Rick's edit uh, of the image. So here we go, over to Rick. Hi, good evening and welcome back to another three minute Lightroom edit challenge. My name is Rick Bradbury, I'm recording this separately ready for Ian's live stream. And today we have an image from Stuart Reese. So 
we will take a look at that now. I have my phone timer ready and here we go. Boop, and we have a landscape shot, um, shot on a Olympus EM5 by the look of it. Um, tenth of a second, 5.6 ISO 200 on the 14 to 42. Um, don't know much about the Olympus system, uh, what lens that is really, so let's take a look. Now I'm going to do a reset on the image and we will go to Adobe Standard. As per usual, uh, we'll go from there. Now, I don't do much in the way of, well, I don't do anything in the way of landscapes, to be honest with you. Um, it's not really something of interest to me um, to shoot personally, but um, I have a good friend of mine, Mark, who does shoot a lot of landscapes, shoots some very good stuff, actually. Um, so uh, I, I do see a fair bit of landscape work through him. Right, um, let's see what we have. So it's a waterfall. Um, I don't know where about the whereabouts the waterfall is, um, but not to worry. Uh, this is all nice and in focus um, enough, really. Um, at five six, uh, I would have expected so on that format. Um, and there we go, tenth of a second, which shows the streaming of the water. Nice, okay. Um, not a whole lot that's going to need doing to this, really. So let's see if we... I'm going to keep it a little bit warm. Um, I'm feeling that the light is warm here. Naturally, it's a little cooler in the shade. There we go. Yeah, a little bit of... Plus eight. Does he really need a plus eight? Has he got a bit of a tint on it? Plus six. Right. Now we'll go. I'm going to go a little bit up on the exposure. Um, highlights just a touch. I'm probably going to do contrast in curves. So let's drag that down. Get a nice strong S curve in there. I'll probably bring back a little bit of shadow detail. Uh, just pump the shadows in a little bit. Let's go before, after, before, after. I'm not bothered about seeing what's under here um, because you can't really see it. Let's go white up a little bit. Make sure that we're not clipping, clipping the shadows there, but that's absolutely fine. And a landscape I feel can benefit from some texture uh, to bring some detail out. A little bit of clarity. Dehaze is probably going to hurt this and crush it too much. So we'll leave that alone. And luminance on the green, maybe just a tad. And I need to sharpen it. Man, three minutes goes quick. There we go. Cool. All right. Shh. Shh. God, that's like a alarm clock in the morning. Um, fairly simple edit, really. Um, nice image. There we go. From there to there, just a little bit more punch to it. Uh, right, we shall hand back to Ian. Okay, thank you for Rick, uh, to Rick for that. So, uh, I'll do my edit a little bit later on. So, let's uh, turn to night photography, which is our theme for tonight. Uh, yeah, what we're looking at is the uh, the blue hour the, uh, the getting these nighttime images and how do we do it so it's um, somewhere between beginner to intermediate sort of level this so those of you who are really experienced will know this uh, already but uh, let's just explain it so you get an understanding of what's involved with uh, with night photography we're talking about for example, the illuminated buildings like the, the GMX Center you've just shown, you've just seen on the screen. We're talking things like light trails. Uh, now, we generally tend to think with something like that, that we're not in control of the light. That's not actually true. We are in control to a certain extent. We are recording what we see, but what we have control over is when we create those images. So the trick to night photography is actually don't do it at night. Do it at dusk. And what we're looking for is a particular time. We've got two light sources that are in play. 
we've got the fading daylight. That's what's going to illuminate the sky. That's what's going to give a little bit of light onto some of the surrounding areas. But we've also got the artificial light that's illuminating the buildings. That's the feature lights on our subject. Now, as you probably know, uh, the camera can only see a limited number of stops. That's called the dynamic range. And a few weeks ago, I covered dynamic range in one of these live streams. And hopefully in the coming week, I'm, going, I'm aiming to get that particular video up online. So if you are not familiar with dynamic range and don't understand what that is, stay tuned to my YouTube feed and there'll be a video appearing during the week which is the extract from that live stream explaining what dynamic range is all about. So what we're trying to do with night photography is to find the time where the fading daylight is of a similar brightness to the artificial light that's illuminating the buildings, that they are both within the dynamic range of our camera. And when does that happen? Well, typically for the UK, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is definitely uh, for the UK, um, that it happens about 20 minutes after the official sunset time. So if you look up online, online what time sunset is, it's about 20 minutes after that. And it lasts for about 20 minutes. Now, if you're I tend to say about sunset because I am not, I'm not a morning person. I have very, very rarely uh, been out photographing a sunrise, uh, but it would be the other way round. It would be the, um, the 20 minutes before sunrise um, and the 20 minutes before that. So that, that's how it would be at that time of day. Um, and what's happening there is you've got the curvature of the Earth, and as the sun is over the horizon, the light is hitting off the atmosphere and bouncing down. And the atmosphere contains water, which gives it that blue color, thus the blue hour. We get that wonderful blue sky in there, that intense blue that really makes those night photos work. But if you go too early, the sky is way too bright. And you can see here an example where uh, the shot was taken a little bit too early on there, it just doesn't work. Or too late. Uh, if it's too late, you end up with everything being outside the dynamic range. Uh, in this scene, everything that's in those blacks is outside the dynamic range on one, one end, and the buildings are overexposed. They're outside the dynamic range on the other end. Now, in my defense, this was a matter of seconds after they turned the lights on on this uh, Egyptian uh, uh, temple. So uh, not my fault that uh, the timings was, was wrong on there. But what about light trails? If you want to capture light trails as part of your night photography, well, you're aiming for a 20 to 30 second exposure. You need to get your camera uh, really on tripod for it. Uh, for that, which means you will probably need a very small aperture, f16, 20, f22, f32, and it will change depending on how early it is in that 20 minute window. Early on in the 20 minute window, you might be f22 on there, and then as it gets darker and darker, uh, you'll find that you're opening up your aperture f16, f11, and so on as the, as the time goes through. But you're aiming to get that, uh, that, 20, that 20 to 30 second exposure with it. So if you get everything right, that long exposure, uh, the right time, and this was taken at the same time as that one of the viaduct that I showed you that didn't work, it was just a matter of waiting that little bit longer. You get that intense blue, you get the light trails that make up uh, the image on there. And here, one very, very important note. If you are shooting at um, 20th of a sec 20 seconds, 30 seconds, you're obviously going to be on tripod. Now, if you're on tripod and you're doing long exposures and you've got any form of image stabilization, you must, you must turn it off. The 
um, thumbnail for this live stream, the photograph of, uh, of Blackpool Tower and the light, the light streams on there. That was the only decent shot I got of the illuminations I did in Blackpool because I forgot to turn uh, image stabilization off. What happens is you, the way image stabilization works, you've got little gyroscopes inside the camera or inside the lens, and it's looking for movement. And as you move around, it compensates for it and, and stabilizes either by moving the lens or moving the sensor to compensate for your movement. Now, if your camera is rock solid on a tripod, that little gyroscope gets confused. And what it does is it vibrates to try and find where the movement is. And that vibration actually introduces um, a blurriness to your image. So don't forget to turn off your image stabilization if you're doing that. Another tip for you is if you are shooting late on and you've got the uh, sodium street lights. Now, I've got to say, there's fewer of them around these days. I couldn't, the shot I'm going to show you, I can't do anymore because they've replaced it with LED ones. But if that's your only light source, you can still take uh, some great images at night, even after that 20 minute slot. And let me show you an image here. Uh, normally it's that horrible brown, mucky brown color. But here's the sort of shot you can end up with. And I've got, under the sodium lights, it's that horrible brown. I bring it into Lightroom. You can do this in Photoshop as well, but I did it in Lightroom. I used the little dropper tool uh, to um, uh, select my white balance by clicking on part of the, the snow. And when I do that, that's the image I came up with. That's after the... Um, uh, the 20 minute uh, window. And the fact that I've taken out the colour cast from the sodium lights gives everything back to the colour it needs to be. And look at that, a blue sky as well. But that really works because of the snow that's in the scene. So if you're shooting snow scenes, you can still do that. What about fireworks? I'm going very quickly because time's moving on. Um, if you want to shoot fireworks, and I've included it for completeness. It's a nice, easy rule on this. Bulb setting, uh, which is the, the B setting on your camera. Uh, ISO 100, either somewhere between F8 and F16, depending on how bright the fireworks are. And that will vary. You just need to experiment with it. Um, and uh, then what you do is as the shot, as the rocket goes up, as you see it going into the sky, you open the shutter using bulb mode. And as the explosion gets to its peak or finishes, you close it and that's when you capture the shot. Now, if you haven't got bulb mode on your camera and you're doing that, it's all in manual mode, this, um, four seconds is, is a good option. Now, if you want slightly more detail on this, I've got a video on my YouTube channel about how to shoot fireworks. It's quite a way down on the list, but if you, you search for it, you'll find it on there. Uh, worth having a look at that on how to, how to shoot fireworks. And you can get some great shots uh, like that uh, following those sort of simple techniques. Right, let's get back to the, uh, uh, the Lightroom uh, challenge. And back to my edit this time of, um, of uh, Stuart's image. Hello, welcome to another three minute Lightroom edit challenge. This time I've got another image from photographer Stuart Rees. So let's get the timer started. We're off and into the develop module. And what have we got? We have got We've got a landscape, a lovely waterfall shot. Right, okay. So first things first, lens corrections as ever. Make sure that they're set. Didn't make a jot of difference. So basic, let's have a look at this. It's nice and sharp, not too noisy on there. Uh, just needs a little bit of a uh, pull up on the exposure. Now I've just got to be careful to make sure that the whites don't blow out. So uh, this area around here, uh, looking up here fine, nothing's blown out. We've managed to avoid any uh, really deep shadows there. I'm just going to bring the shadows up 
fractionally, don't need to do much on there. Right, white balance. This is another tricky one. I actually quite like the white balance on there as it stands. Now, do I need to do a crop? It's a little bit messy at the bottom. Ah, so just come in, tidy that up a little bit there. Maybe a, a smidgen on that side and on there. I want to keep the waterfall on the thirds. So something like that, I would think, for the crop. Uh, now, I want to bring out the texture down here. So bring the texture slider up. Hmm. Uh, clarity. We've got to be careful about not bringing too much clarity into that. That's not too bad. Love the waterfall and the, um, the, the flow of that uh, on there. Bit of a bright area along the edges. So I'm going to do one of my standards, which is the vignette. Uh, I know I do it regularly, but let's just, just do a very, very slight vignette on there. And that's not much at all. And I'm going to give it a big feathering out. Let me just see what the difference makes. With, without, with, without. Yeah, I, th I think it helps, just helps concentrate the eye into the middle of the shot uh, on there. Anything else I'm going to do to it? You know, I don't know that I would other than just the usual little bit of sharpening up, up, then alt key, a bit of masking just to see where we're going to get it. So just onto the edges there. And that, I think, is it. And I've beaten the timer this time. Well, just about. So that was the, the edit. Let's have a look at the before and after on it. So before was a little bit dark. and We've just brought out the detail and the clarity in there uh, on that. So uh, feedback and comments about the image, I'll give that uh, in, the live, uh, in the live show. So time to hand back to myself in the studio. See you there. Okay, and we're back. Right. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, as I said, I'll give the feedback in a little while. Let's have a look at the, uh, at the chat and the questions that I've got. Um, I've, uh, as far as I'm aware, I've just got two questions that came that came in. Uh, first one from Mal uh, from uh, from Michael, who said, um, "What would convince me to buy an f 2.8 over an f4 lens?" Um, two factors uh, on there. Um, obviously, price is going to uh, um, be an important thing in in there. But, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm a theatre photographer and that f2.8, I have the um, uh, 70 to 200 f2.8 uh, lens. And that for me is my favourite lens for theatre work. I can get in close with people, it's tack sharp, but also it allows me to throw the background out of focus so I can isolate my subject. And that for me is important. But what's even more important is I don't have to put the ISO quite so high uh, when I'm doing theatre work. So it keep, gives me a cleaner image. And we were talking about that earlier in answer to, uh, to David's question about the importance of, um, of trying to keep your ISO as low as possible for that clean image. With the, the, Fewer, uh, fewer with less noise in there. So that's the first thing which would convince me. Again, again, it's it's a it depends on the price. Uh, the other thing is to do with bokeh and to do with um, that out of uh, out of focus background. And there is something really special about having an out of focus background, and something really special about having a really good bokeh image. Uh, in case anyone doesn't know, bokeh is the little blobs of light in the background or foreground of an image and an out of focus look to it. Uh, so those are the things which would convince me. But as a professional, 
this is my business, then any purchase I make, I have to weigh up with the idea of, uh, am I going to be able to earn that money back? And with the theatre one, it's a case of, I knew I needed a better lens for what I was doing. Now, I don't make a great deal of money doing theatre work, uh, but I still need the right tool for the job. So that was the one, um, what I went for with that. So hopefully that, that's helped answer your, your question, Michael. Let me know if I've missed the point on there, um, but uh, um, that was, I think, what you, you, you were driving at. The other question was from Patricia about Lightroom for architecture uh, work. Uh, as my regulars know, I'm a big, big um, advocate of Lightroom. I'm, I'm not a fanboy in the sense that I'm, I'm not uncritical of it. I, 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 I will speak honestly about Lightroom. Some, some things it really sucks at, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, but for architectural work, well, I'm, I would consider myself uh, a travel photographer, an educator, and a little bit of studio work uh, as, as well. Whether it's in that order, I don't know. Uh, those are my three key areas, uh, as well as the theatre work. Uh, so with architecture, one of the things that you need to, need to do, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, is making sure your verticals are vertical. And there are some really good tools in Lightroom to be able to do that. Now, yes, they are also available in uh, Adobe Camera Raw because it's the same engine. So if you're comfortable with using Adobe Camera Raw, then you will be comfortable using Lightroom. You'll get the same processing done there. Where Lightroom will come into its own is in two areas. First of all, the cataloging. Now, I don't know how you manage all your images, whether you are doing it purely for pleasure or for business, or whether there's going to come a point where somebody might say to you, um, I'd like, to, uh, have you got any images of, a, um, of iconic, um, ionic, I mean, ionic columns or Corinthian column, columns? And if you've got all that catalogued in Lightroom, you can get to your images so quickly uh, by, by doing that. And you don't have to spend a huge amount of time just to put in the, the basic bits of information that you might need from a shoot. It will help you locate them. The other area is the ability to speed up your workflow. Lightroom has a great capability of, yes, you can batch process and apply the whole uh, set of settings to uh, uh, to one uh, to one image from uh, from one image to a whole lot, but actually that's not where you get the real benefit of it. Where you get the real benefit is you process one image, move on to the next, and then you can you can copy and paste selectively certain settings. You can put things into presets where you can store particular setups in there. So it makes it really easy. If you always do a particular set of processing on a particular type of building, then you can, you can store that. Uh, so those sorts of things are the things which will speed up your workflow. Think of it as the mistake people make with Lightroom is not about um, saying, oh, I, I can do the processing uh, just the same in Photoshop. You probably can. Where the benefits are in Lightroom are the workflow management and that really speeding you through how you process your images. If you work with Lightroom, it will help you and it will speed up your workflow. Uh, I would hate to handle the number of images I have to handle in Photoshop alone without Lightroom, without that uh, control, to be able to tag images to say, oh, these still need work on them, to be able to put colour um, color, color code folders and images to know where I'm up to. All those sorts of things will really help. Um, but without knowing your individual um, scenario, it's difficult to say exactly which areas you would get the best benefit from. But I would like to think that it would help you. Um, 
Uh, so don't know if that's helped. Uh, uh, let me know in the, in, in the comments and in the live stream if you think that's been used, that's helped you um, and answered your question on there. So let's move on. Uh, oh, I should have updated my slides from last week. Night images in the uh, Facebook group. I'm going to move over to the Facebook group and let's have a look what we've got. So a few people have been posting uh, some of their night, sharing their night images while, the, the, uh, while we've been going on. A nice shot here from, uh, from, uh, from Gary, uh, which is, I'm guessing, uh, oh, yep, Venice at night. So lovely image there, Gary. Uh, just beyond, just slightly beyond that magic 20 minutes on there. Uh, but yeah, fantastic shot, lovely uh, memory um, type of shot on there. Uh, one, uh, one thought for you with, with that is, um, I don't know whether you had tripod with you, but a longer exposure to sort of blur everything with it and to blur the water might have been a nice touch on, uh, on that. Uh, what else? Who else? Oh, come on. Who else has been sharing images? I think Loz has. Yeah, Loz uh, from Salford Keys, 12 years ago. This wasn't the, the, um, the, uh, the event I ran, was it, Loz? Because uh, I, I did a couple at, uh, at Salford Keys uh, doing night photography, and I can see there's at least one other photographer uh, on there. Again, just at the, at the back end of the, um, the magic window on there, the magic 20 minutes. Uh, with it, but lovely shots. Oh, I have that shot. I have that same shot. I'm sure this must be the same night I, I was there. And the bridge as well. That's during the magic um, period of time on there. So uh, thank you for uh, for sharing those nice nice images. Who else has been sharing them? Um, I don't think there's any more looking at that on there. Let's have a quick scroll. Oh, yes, hang on, from Peter has got one. Uh, and that's Paris. Never been to Paris. I've actually only ever been to France once. And that was only for, uh, for one day. I got two videos out of it and they are both on my channel, my uh, travel photography channel, uh, was Cherbourg. Uh, the only time I've ever been in France. I must go back, must go back. Uh, on there. Right. Any more? No, no, that appears to be it. So thank you for sharing those, folks. Nice to see your night images uh, as well. So, uh, right. I think that just leaves feedback on the... Ah. I've lost a slide in there because I should be, and I will do this very, very quickly uh, now. I just want to go back to Lightroom and go to that waterfall image once I get there and just give Gary a little bit of, um, no, sorry, um, Stuart, a little bit of feedback on that one. He says he's trying to find the image. There we go. Yeah, but there, there we have the, the waterfall image. Yeah, um, not a lot to actually say, to be perfectly honest with you uh, on this one. I really like the shot. The main thing I would say about it is watch that little bit of tattiness at the, in the foreground that I've cropped out. Just be a little bit careful of that. I would probably have been tempted to move down just slightly lower with the tripod uh, on there, which would bring this... Um, can you see my mouse on there? Um, the, uh, uh, that foreground a little bit more prominent into the image uh, on there. Uh, so those have been the main things. The colour is good, composition's good, the time's good on it. Let me just have a look at the settings. Tenth of a second is fine on there. Um, yeah, great shot. Not a lot else to say really. Um, uh, on it. 
um, well executed um, as, uh, as the image goes. So uh, let me just now wrap up the, the live stream. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's watched tonight, for people who've taken part in the chat um, on there. And let me, as we say, the final comments on the chat. Um, ah, yes, the first reference to my, uh, my little figurines from Raymond. Yes, Hoovians rule, rock on Hoovians uh, on there, um, on that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Patricia saying thanks for the comment for the information on Light Lightroom. Lots of Lightroom videos on uh, on the channel. Uh, have a look at some of those, and I, I tend to touch on Lightroom quite a bit uh, in the, the live streams. Uh, and Loss confirming that yes, those photos were taken at the event I ran. Yeah, it's good to know that. Um, and Gary telling me that image stabilization doesn't need turning off with the Sony. Ooh. Ooh, very posh. Right. Okay. Oh, no feedback from Rick. Yes, there was feedback from Rick. Uh, I'll play that in. I've overrun. Sorry. It's because I haven't got the slide in there. So Rick's feedback, and then I really will finish. Okay, Stuart. Um... Difficult one for me to give you some feedback on because landscape's just not my thing, um, but I'll do my best. So we'll go to rule of thirds. Um, Composition-wise, it looked well balanced. Um, I like that we're leaning on a third here. Um, the water leads into the frame, into the waterfall and follows up. And Or, oh, <laughs> if you want to follow it the other way, it comes down from the top right and down. I like how the water's streaming and a little bit blurred with the, shot, the slower shutter speed. Um, I know it's very, very popular in landscape photography, or was certainly for a time, for, to do the blurred water, but, you know, extreme blurred water. Um, I like the fact that you've not gone super slow um, with the shutter on it, um, so it maintains a little bit of a look of water rather than foam. <laughs> Um, that's flowing so you can still see some of what's going on um, as it impacts the rocks. So all that works really well and the splash there works really nice. It's almost like a nice place to go and sit for a bit. Um, like I say, no idea where it is. Um, I only bring in the raw file to look at, nothing else that's sent over. Um, but nicely done. Uh, it makes me wonder where it is. It makes me want to go there. So overall, um, it's nice. We've got some foreground interest here. I don't mind the trees and bushes creeping in on this side. It kind of frames um, the hero of the shot, really, which is the waterfall. The, there's a potential for this maybe to draw the eye away because it's a bright spot. Um, dappled light through the trees. And you could probably do a bit of local work on that um, to improve that. In fact, go on, let's have a look. So... Well, let's go with a brush and we'll do exposure. We're going to bring it down a little bit. Tone down the highlights, tone down the whites. Take the masking off and punch in. Uh, let's just see if we can bring that area down just a little bit on the spots there. I don't want to do it too much because you expect them to be bright to a point. Um, I mean, it's point spot source of sources of light through trees, you know, dappled light. So it does look bright to the eye. Just want to see if I can tone it down. Maybe a little. I'm not going to go over all of them because that'll just take too long. Uh, there we go. Now let's see if we can do a little bit more. Yeah, there's a, there's wiggle room in there to bring that down, and you could probably do a bit more of a refined job. Uh, than that really, but it just tones it down just a little bit. Um, again, I'm expecting to see bright spots because of the type of light that's coming through, so I wouldn't ever worry about getting rid of it completely, um, but just tone them down just a touch, so then we have the white or brighter elements of the waterfall um, drawing the eye back a little bit more versus this. Um, well, cool, nice shot. Um, let me know where this place is in the chat, um, and I will hand back to Ian. Right, okay, time for me to uh, finish off with uh, my usual set of thanks 
Uh, thanks for everyone who's watching, particularly the newbies. I hope you found it helpful. I hope we'll see you in, uh, on future Sunday nights on there. Thanks to David and Terry for the questions at the beginning and for uh, Michael and Patricia for the ones which came up later on there. Thanks for Stuart for the image, Rick for, uh, for taking part uh, as ever uh, on, on that. And my usual wrap up, please subscribe to the channel. Please comment. Please go and hit like now. The, the, we're, we're over. Hit like. Go on. You, you, you know you want to. Next week, we're on landscape photography and some hints and tips on that, some advice on landscape photography. Um, if you're a member of the Facebook group, post your landscape photos in there in advance of next week so we can see them. And I will, honestly, Kev, I will have your, um, uh, uh, your showcase next week. That is definite. <laughs> So thanks for watching and as ever folks, um, keep making great photos. Bye for now. This is where I have to record a false and uh, an alternative ending for the uh, 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 for the cut down version. So uh, let's do that now. Thanks for watching this cut down version of Ian's Studio Live. If you want to see the full version, that will be over in my academy. The details of how to join the academy are up on the screen there. It's only six pound a month or sixty pound a year, and you'll have access to the full archive there, plus lots of other uh, resources for. Uh, helping you with your photography, whether it's lighting sheets, inspiration sheets, and training courses which are currently in development. So, uh, see you over there, and thanks for watching. Until next time, keep making great photos. Mm -hmm.